Hello friends, this is Odds for Real on God, and today we're going to talk about offerings. A part of DVD that is often overlooked or ignored by many players, but that really shouldn't be. Many of these bad boys have surprising synergies and deceivingly strong effects that are not super intuitive. So if you stick around and watch this video, you'll know exactly how strong each of them are so that you can use them yourself or at least not have them be used against you by the other side. Now, uh, to make our job a little bit easier, we're going to classify and color code these offerings. We'll turn them red if it's only for killer. We'll turn them blue if they're only for survivor. And we're going to keep them purple if they are for both sides. Because many of these offerings kind of look the same and it's hard to tell them apart, we're also going to add a text layer on top to explain what they do. So it's a little bit easier to see it visually. And this is the resulting tier list. Obviously a little bit subjective, but this is my best guess as to how strong these uh, offerings are. If that's what you're here for, you can screenshot this and save it for posterity. Now, let's get into dissecting what makes each of these offering and their types strong or not so strong. Let's get into it. Okay, so right off the bat, before we break down what all of these offerings do in the match, let's talk about the ones that don't actually do anything in the match itself. Uh, we're talking about the blood point offerings, all of them, the black word for killer and the white word for survivor, which lets them save their add-ons and their items and not lose them in that match. Um, these offerings are okay. The blood points in particular are amazing to let you level up and buy stuff faster. You should use them almost all the time. They are great, but obviously they don't actually do anything in the game. If you bring a lot of blood points, you're not going to win just because of that. It doesn't actually affect the gameplay in any way. So we're going to ignore all of these because they don't actually affect the match. Moving on to the rest, though, we will now start from the top. And the best type of offering, by far the most impactful that decides the outcome of the match the most, are the map offerings. When a player brings a map offering, they are sent to a realm. A realm sometimes has one, two, or five maps to choose from. And then the game will take place there, unless there's another offering to change that. This is extremely impactful. If you've been playing DBD for more than one day, I'm sure you're aware that some maps are extremely busted and super, super difficult for killer. And some other maps, if you know that you're going to be there and you bring certain perks, certain add-ons on certain killers, they can be really, really difficult for survivor. So being able to choose this with a high chance of succeeding if the other side doesn't do something about it is the most powerful thing that offerings can do for you. And as you could see, I broke down these offerings into all of the individual ones uh, to give you an idea how annoying and how powerful they can be to use for you or to be used against you. Uh, but back to all of the offerings here. The map offerings are just by far the best. Let's just put it that way. Fittingly, the second best type are the cancelling words. Uh, these green hands allow you to cancel a map offering. If you're playing killer, you can bring this and guarantee that you'll go to a random map. Uh, mind you, if survivors try to send you to Haddonfield and you cancel Haddonfield, you can still go to Haddonfield. There's still a small chance, not 100%, but there's still a small chance that you could still go to that map or even a worse one. So these things don't do any miracles. Also, you could use it as a survivor and have the same problem. You could counter a map offering from the killer and still go to a similar or the same map. Uh, one thing to note, though, is that survivors can actually beat the cancelling ward. If the killer brings the cancelling ward, but survivors bring four identical map offerings, it actually gets overturned and ignored. So if four survivors want to send you to Ormond, they can do it, and there's nothing you can do to stop it other than bringing your own map offering. That's why they're so strong. And then you have a one in five to go to whichever map you picked. So yeah, uh, cancelling wards help, but map offerings are still super busted. Next up, we have the hatch offerings. These offerings will pick the location where the hatch spawns and guarantee that it's there if the map is available. So most maps have a shack, 85% of them, and most maps have a main building, about 80% of them, a little bit less. So if you use these offerings and you go to one of the maps that has this, 
uh, it's still a bit random whether or not you'll get it, you will know where the hatch will spawn. And this can be good for both sides. For killer, if you know where the hatch is, you can kill the third survivor, immediately go there and then close it right as it appears. And you have a basically guaranteed way to kill the fourth survivor every single time, which is powerful. As survivor, you can also use this to get in there with a key and open it and escape yourself. Or sometimes as an emergency exit. If your teammates all die, you can find the hatch. If your teammates all leave and you are stuck with a pig uh, bear, a reverse bird trap, you can also find the hatch and know exactly where it will be. Because there's more shacks than there are main buildings, the shack one is a little bit stronger in my eyes, but they're both decent. However, if you go to a map that doesn't have a main or a shack, like say RPD, these don't do anything at all. So they are risky unless you also know which map you're going to. Next up, we talk about the luck offerings, and these are actually kind of crazy. They begin on very, very humble um, effects, but can actually be quite fearsome. Uh, luck offerings can be used to have a better chance to find a second add-on with the ace perk, ace in the hole, but let's ignore that. That's very minor. I don't think anyone really cares about that. The main goal of luck offerings is to unhook yourself from the hook on the first stage. A normal survivor trying to escape three times has roughly a cumulative chance of 11% to escape, normally, base kit, if they try three times. With 1% luck, this goes up by a little bit. With 2% luck, this goes up by a little bit. With 3% luck, it goes up all the way to 20%. That's not bad. That's a 1 in 5 to escape a hook. If your teammates all mess up and you have to escape the hook, you have a 1 in 5. That's not terrible. But the really, really nice part comes when these offerings are used in conjunction, especially the salty lips, the purple one at the top. The salty lips can be used on yourself and then your teammates because it's to everyone and then they can be stacked. And if you stack the salty lips with certain perks, namely up the ante and certain other perks, namely slippery mid, your chances to escape the hook are nearly guaranteed. You can be in the high 90s uh, percent chance. And these offerings make the difference and can make that chance twice as likely sometimes. So you can go from 80% chance of success to 90% chance of success and similar numbers. So these offerings are actually really, really good. From a 4 out of 5 to a 9 out of 10 chance with just some of these offerings, that is a big, big deal. So yeah, if you go out of your way to do a anti-escape uh, <laughs> Uh, from hook type of build, they are actually really, really powerful. And also, if a game goes south and everything's going wrong and you have some of these offerings in play, you have a pretty realistic chance to unhook yourself even with no perks. So that, in my view, makes them decent and potentially quite strong if used correctly. Moving on, we have the hook spawns. Um, there are three for killer of differing intensity and one for survivor that is much weaker but survivors obviously can use four of them because there's four survivors. Now, I'm very surprised. These offerings are actually quite good. You as a killer should always bring the strongest that you have if you want to use them. So obviously the purple one is the best and you should bring the purple uh, and, and, and never bring anything else if you have enough. And from my observation, the fact that it reduces the, the distance uh, from where hooks can spawn just basically means that there's more hooks available in the map. Uh, situations where you've killed one person and there's nothing around to hook someone else or one exit gate is open, multiple people are crawling out and you don't have enough hooks, they are far less likely to happen. You are also more likely to get two hooks that are really close to each other, where if survivors make a mistake, you can hook two people and defend them at the same time. Um, from my testing on larger maps, with the purple minus 3.5 meters, you sometimes have three to four hooks extra on a map three to four hooks extra. That is huge. That saves so much time and so much headache and potentially give you even extra kills. It is really, really good to bring this uh, this offering. That being said, sometimes you don't care about this. Sometimes the basement's there, so it doesn't matter. Sometimes you don't need that many hooks. Sometimes you have agitation, so it's not like that insane. So, for killer, you might get two, three, four extra hooks, maybe on the next one two, one, three extra hooks, and then the yellow one maybe gives you one or two extra hooks. Not bad. Seriously, not bad. Now, for the survivor side, we have the, the one that extends it. 
Um, this basically robs the killer of one or two hooks, depending on the map. Not bad. You can bring one or two, and for considering that survivors have a lot of slots and they can bring one of these every match if they want to, it is pretty impactful. This can sometimes make a very useful hook that almost always spawns in one place, just not spawn there. And that can be powerful. It does seem, however, that it doesn't stack super effectively. Bringing four of these as a survivor isn't all that good because there's a minimum of hooks that always spawn. So as a survivor, I don't recommend that you bring these on in mass. You shouldn't bring like four or three of them. But if you bring one or two per game, on some large maps, that will make a huge difference sometimes. And you will quickly create uh, dead zones where the killer cannot hook you. And sabotaging and, and, and getting off and wiggling off the killer's grass can be much, much easier. So it's actually quite significant um, for survivors. Not to mention that if there's less hook, uh, less hooks available, the killer by by force will have to spend a little bit more time carrying survivors, which over the course of a game is a few, a few, a few seconds that add up. Not too bad at all. We then move on to the mist offerings. The mist offerings are a little bit strange. Um, when you bring the, the, the ones that increase it, they make more fog appear in the maps. And the effect of fog is a bit strange. It actually caps at 75%. So if two people bring one purple uh, mist, or if one person brings one purple mist, it's the exact same. You don't want to bring four purple mists. Much like the hook one that we talked about before, it's typically better that survivors bring just one of these to try to make it a bit more difficult for the killer to see. These are offerings that the killer can also bring, but in my opinion, most killers don't want to bring this. It is a bad offering for a killer. You almost never want to bring this. You see far less than they do. I've, I've made comparisons where I see survivors almost nothing at all, and they see me just fine with fog. So this is mostly a survivor um, item that they use better than killer. If you bring a 75% or a 50%, that does make seeing scratch marks a little bit harder, tracking things a little bit harder, and seeing people on the ground a little bit harder, it is quite significant. And funnily enough, on some maps, the fog is super, super thick and super hard to see. In Eerie of Crows, for example, the, the fog is extremely tall and oppressive. So a group of survivors could send uh, the killer to the Eerie, that's one offering, then reduce the amount of hooks by one or two, um, with the with the oak that we talked about, and then also make it very difficult for the killer to see what's in front of him with one of these mist offerings. So that is actually quite powerful. In many other maps, the mist does almost nothing. And every now and then, the mist can also work against you by hiding the killer slightly. So yeah, they're not insanely powerful, but they're not too bad. And they're pretty easy to bring uh, for survivors. We also have the 25% extra mist, which is very easy to see through. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, it gets a bit in your way, not too, not too bad. And then we have the minus 50% mist. This is something that survivors should never bring. And this is something that the killer could bring to try to undo the mist. But, but why would you bring that as a killer? You don't know that they're going to bring it. You, there's no way you know. And even if you do know, you probably want to use another stronger offering. Uh, even then, if they bring a 75, you're not countering all of it. It is a terrible, terrible idea. It does do something, but yeah, you probably should never run this as a killer, let alone as a survivor. <sighs> Moving on, we have the two offerings that make the basement spawn in certain locations. Um, these offerings have also a secondary effect of showing you the hooks in the basement at the start of the game. So even if you go to one of the maps that doesn't have a shack, that doesn't have a main, you will at the start see the white colored hooks uh, indicating where the basement is. This is nice if you want to do a basement archive or challenge and you want to find it. I mean, you can use this to find it quickly and call it out to your team. Um, so that's useful. Do you really want to make the hatch spawn somewhere like this? And not to mention that it also can just not work if the map doesn't have a main or a shack. Um, not a lot. It's typically not very good. I will tell you, though, that the basement in shack is significantly better because this is something that the killer typically doesn't want. Shack, more often than not, especially on the bad maps for killer, is on the edges. Let's think about maps where shack is on the edge. Ormond, oof. Um, 
oftentimes uh, Badham, Eerie, Garden of Joy, all of these tricky maps for killer, having the basement in the shack is a horrible thing. Because if you have Orman and the basement is in the middle, that's something that you can get to from different angles. But if in Orman you have the shack have the basement, then the basement is basically useless. Ironworks, same idea. So if if a group of survivors is particularly evil, they could send you to the Eerie or to Orman or to Ironworks and then make the shack have the basement so that even if you're playing Cannibal or, or another killer that can defend basement, you can't even do it in the middle. They just avoid going down by, by the shack and now you don't even have that basement. So a really mean group of survivors could use the basement offering to deny you even a middle basement on top of using a map offering. So that could be really, really mean. Um, on the other side, you could also play killer and just use one of these, but you would just be better off using a map offering and taking your chances. Don't forget that the basement is going to spawn somewhere anyway, and in some maps there's only one basement spot. Like for example, Haddonfield, it only spawns in main, so these offerings can be completely worthless. I think they have a bit more power uh, in the hands of survivors. Moving on, we have the Moris. Uh, Moris used to be really scary, but now they're they're really not that useful. Um, um, the first pink and green Mori are the more powerful ones. They allow you to instantly do the kill animation on a Swabber when they go down and they've been hooked twice before. Now, in the previous meta, a really common perk used to be Decisive Strike. Decisive Strike would stun the killer for a very long time. So if you were tunneling a survivor off hook, if you were going after a survivor right after, get, after they get unhooked, you could use this Moris to guarantee that you could kill them, even without uh, Decisive uh, getting in the way. But Decisive is not that common anymore. If it triggers, it's not that big of a deal. People have basket bar time that lasts 10 seconds, sometimes 20 with perks, or sometimes even more. So tunneling is very difficult. And Moris don't help you to tunnel anymore as much. In my opinion, these are just not that great. It almost always takes less time to pick up the survivor and hook them somewhere. But let's talk about some of the good things that Moris can do. If you play a killer like Pig, you can Mori a survivor very quickly and save time and avoid risk of pallet saves, the size strike, flashlight saves. Uh, you also don't get rid of a hook. So if you have a Scorch Hook perk, for example, you don't have to get rid of it because the hook doesn't disappear when the survivor dies. So that's a small advantage. If there's multiple survivors crawling out of the gate and you don't have enough hooks, you can also use the Mori to kill them if that's the case, if it's possible for each of them. And obviously, with the pink one, you can do it four times, and with the green one, you can do it only once or whatever. Overall, nothing that insane, in my opinion. Um, I would be a lot more... If anything, when survivors see that the offering doesn't flip, they're going to try hard more. So I don't think these offerings are that good. The yellow Mori is a bit special. It lets you Mori anyone if they are the last survivor. So, yeah, this isn't great either. Um, it used to be that you could have a survivor escaping through the gates and they could have decisive, but that doesn't work anymore. In the endgame, there's no longer a decisive strike. So this Mori only helps you to kill the last survivor, even if you haven't hooked them, and you couldn't kill them any other way. So normally the last survivor you can just pick up, but if for some reason you cannot pick them up, they have flip-flop, there's no hooks available, uh, your back hurts, I don't know, you can use the Mori to just kill them. So in one out of every 300 games, maybe this can get you an extra kill. But otherwise, it's really nothing that crazy. Yeah, it's really not that strong. Uh, moving on, we now talk about the chest coins. We have the survivor ones that let you spawn plus two and plus one chest, and the killer one that lets you spawn minus two and minus one. Now, most maps in Dead by Daylight come with three chests, one of them always in basement, always, always, always in basement, and then two other chests spawn uh, randomly. There are a couple exceptions, maps like Temple of Purgation, they can actually spawn uh, four. There's also one in main building, for example. So, um, with some exception, most maps have three chests. Um, now, Adding extra chests for survivors, especially considering that they get to use more offerings, is a pretty good deal. Um, they can ignore them, so if you spawn by a chest and you don't really need it, you can just do gems, do whatever, and maybe in the end game, 
when time is not an issue, you can look for a medkit or something. Or maybe you can bring these chest coins when you know 100% that your build is going to help you. You have pharmacy, you have all of these crazy perks, then yes, having extra chests means that you're going to find them more likely and even get more of them. So you could get three amazing green medkits super quick. That is awesome. And it also makes sure that you can get into uh, into get you can get these items without having to go into basement, which is kind of dangerous sometimes. So the purple coin is nice, and the yellow coin is okayish. Now for killer, is it a good thing that you deny them chests? Well, first of all, it's a losing battle. If they use three coins and you use one coin, they're going to win. They're going to have chests, no matter what you do. If they want to have chests, they're going to have chests. And honestly, I think that these. Offerings are borderline bad for you. Chests, if survivors don't have a lot of items and, and, and perks for, uh, to, to plunder, they're not that good. Survivors can spend upwards of 10, 11 seconds opening them and getting to them and away from them, and then get a terrible item like a green map with no add-ons. So you should probably let your survivors waste time on chests because that is very likely to backfire. If you remove chests, then they're going to do more gents and that's probably not a good thing. So removing chests, I'm not even sure it's a good idea for killer. I put it on neutral because it seems to me like it's okay, but also can backfire. So yeah, nothing incredible. You should probably ignore these as a killer unless you really hate survivors. Then we move on to the shrouds, these little clothes. And as you can see, they're also all over the place. The first one is Vigo Shroud. This allows a survivor to spawn as far as possible from the killer. It is a hidden offering, so the killer can kind of guess that it's there, but they don't know exactly which of these ones it is. Um, it's not bad. It's not bad. If you go to a, to a very big map, uh, and you have a toolbox and you want to spawn far away from the killer. I mean, the game was probably going to spawn you far away from the killer anyway, but this can be good. It can let you use a toolbox early. It can let you do a totem early. If you're a bit of a scaredy cat, it can let you do gens in peace while someone else takes chase. So it's not too bad. And also you can use it to reverse engineer the location of the killer. So if you spawn on one side of the map, you can immediately call it to your friends, hey guys, I have Vigor Shroud, I spawned in Shack, so he's probably on the opposite end, watch out. So that can be good, and it can be alright. Nothing insane. But then we go to the other Shrouds, which are really not so good. We have the Shroud of Union. This makes two survivors spawn together. It's not really that good. Uh, sometimes if you have proved thyself and you want to do a challenge to do gems together, um, the killer doesn't have lethal pursuer or corrupt. Yeah, it can work out. It can be okay. Sometimes it's all right. But for the most part, survivors uh, have a lot more strength if they split up on different gens. That's why you don't necessarily want to bring this offering all the time. It's better for you to split up and do gens on different sides of the map so the killer cannot bother you all at once. Uh, and that's precisely why the next two uh, shrouds are bad. The shroud of binding and the shroud... Oh god, Oh, and the Shroud of Separation are just terrible. These should be switched. The, the Suavar one makes all the Suavars spawn together, which is something that, unless you're doing some Scooby-Doo stuff, you don't ever want to do. If all the Suavars spawn together, the killer can find you really quickly and bother all of you, and you will never find gems quickly. You will waste so much time. So unless you have some kind of insane 300 IQ plan, don't ever use the Shroud of Binding. And then we have the Shroud of Separation for the killer. This is the opposite. You don't want survivors to be separated. You want them to be together so you can go there and bother them all at once. If survivors spawn separated with this offering, they will start four different gens sometimes, and you will start to lose the game super, super fast. So these are actually bad, bad offerings that you should 100% avoid. And I believe with that, we've covered, we've covered all of them. That's it. We've covered all of them. Now, what I'm really, really interested is to know if I missed anything or if there's any other quirk that I forgot to mention. Maybe you know some map where the mist is super, super strong or some killer that can use the mist super, super well. If you have any interesting information that you want to share with me and the rest of the community, I would really appreciate it. But yeah, that's about it. That's all the offerings explained. And I hope you found this video useful. See you in the next one.